Okay. I am Alan Kersner. I teach in the Innovation and Entrepreneurship Department. I'm also director of the Temple University Entrepreneurship Academy. I could see from the names here that many of you have been at previous sessions. So I won't go into a lot of detail about what I do other than try to reach out to people across campus to facilitate entrepreneurial thinking and doing. And one major initiative we have is in freelancing. This is the third year we have run or fourth year we have run freelancing workshops. Today is the fourth of four workshops. And I'd like to tell you tonight's session is launching your freelancing business, your first 90 days. So you're gonna hear a lot from a very distinguished panel about how they got started, their career journey, how they got started and what they believe are keys to success and what they recommend to all of you. After this session, we are going to be doing our first springboard to launch accelerator for freelancing students. It is open to all Temple University students, alumni, staff, and faculty. And we're basically going to have three interactive working sessions where you'll work in very small groups with one on one mentoring during those sessions. And it will culminate in a basically, I want to say, unveiling a virtual exhibit and a website launch where you have the opportunity to talk about your skills and the services and products you provide or sell to people within the Temple University community and the surrounding communities in Philadelphia at large. Basically, in order to be able to be admitted into this accelerator, you need to have attended or viewed the videos of at least three sessions, either the four workshops or the original uh, Inspire session we did. It's a very short application. It needs to be completed end of day on March 22nd. There'll be a small screening committee to review those applications. And then people who get through that part will do a short interview with some of us for the final stage to acceptance. And it's something we're very excited about. In terms of timing, as I said, the submission deadline is March 22nd. We'll announce all the accepted participants on March 24th. And then the three workshop sessions are Monday evenings, 5 to 6.30, on March 29th, April 5th, April 12th, and the big unveiling or showcase will be April 19th. So I would strongly urge all of you who are interested in freelancing and consulting and being a part of the gig economy, or selling your own artwork or uh, written pieces or music to fill out the application by next Monday so you could participate in the accelerator. Okay, so I'd now like to introduce our very distinguished panel. First is Erica Wernick, who is founder and founder of Hollywood Success Coach, if I said that right. She is also author of a relatively new book, which is entitled Meant for This, The Mindset and Strategy to Improve Your Impossible Dreams. And Erica was originally a Tyler BFA student. And over the next hour, will take us through her journey, and the keys to success. Next up, we have Jen Dennis, who is currently creative director for Green Thumb Industries, 
which is a cannabis-based product line. And she also has done a number of interesting things. She was a graphic artist and professor at Tyler. She's done a lot of brand building. And also, if I'm using the right term, Jen, is a licensed yoga instructor and had a fairly prolific business in yoga instruction when she was in Philadelphia. You got Next, it. Was that right? Close, okay. Next up is Michael Zanders, who is an assistant professor of music therapy at Boyer uh, in the School of Music and Dance. And Michael right now is on the clinical side, but he was a sole practitioner. And he continues to advise a lot of students who have launched their own telehealth business. So we look forward to hearing from Michael. And our fourth distinguished panelist is Professor Lynn Washington out of the Klein School. And Lynn also has a very varied background. He has worked for the Supreme Court, they do this right, Justice of the Supreme Court in Pennsylvania and has also been an investigative reporter on four different continents. And at Temple founded Neighbors.com, which is sort of a Temple community website that's managed by students. And it has been recognized as the best university community website in the country. So as you can see, we have extremely distinguished panelists with very varied career paths and fields of interest. Before we get into the questions, if you have questions for the panelists, please type them in the chat room. And at the end of the panel discussion, we will ask the panelists your questions. Okay, so the first question, and let's start with Jen. Jen, you are a graphic artist in Philadelphia. Can you sort of take us through your career path that has made you, I believe, creative director of Green Thumb Industries? Sure thing. Thanks, Alan. Um, so I started my career in Philadelphia. I was working for an internet advertising agency that has joined, I think, the Digitas uh, conglomerate of agencies now. Um, but I started there doing online work um, just around the early 2000s. Um, from there, I went into advertising and worked for an agency that's now called Quaker City Mercantile. It's still based in Philadelphia. It used to be called Gyro Worldwide. And there I worked my way up as a graphic designer from graphic designer to art director to creative director in the agency setting. Um, and I think that creative titles can vary depending on which part of the industry you're in, whether if you're the agency side or in-house with the company. So there can be different levels within. Um, after being in the advertising agency for a little over 10 years, I got burnt out and I decided to go off on my own and figured I had had enough experience to try something on my own. And if I wasn't, if I was going to ever try it, this would be a good time to do it. Um, at the same time, I was studying a lot of yoga at um, a Philadelphia-based yoga studio and was enjoying it so much that I went into the teacher training program so that I could become certified to teach. And it coincided with the freelancing. So I was kind of double freelancing at the same time. So I was freelancing from a design perspective for various types of local and national clients that I had kept in touch with during my advertising agency days. And I also started teaching yoga on the side because I don't know if anyone knows anything about the yoga community, but it doesn't pay the bills all, all the way through. So it was a good supplement to the sort of day job of freelancing and design work. Um, so yoga teaching a few days a week, daytime, the flexibility of freelancing for my design work allowed me to teach to freelance yoga teach at various different times of the day and evening, um, which a day job would have been made it hard to do. Um, after doing that for about a little over three years, one of my freelance clients was um, a fast casual restaurant company that some of you might be familiar with called Honey Grow. And they were a freelance client of mine. And I worked really closely with the owner so much so that he decided that he needed somebody with my skills in-house. 
So he invited me to join the company to be their first um, chief brand officer. Um, and being a startup, that C-level sort of has a like a wiggle room to it. Um, but C-level at a startup is probably equivalent to like maybe like a VP in a more corporate um, established structure. But either way, it was great to work with a company from the ground up. And I think that was a really good example of how you never know where freelance can lead. Um, and it can lead to all different types of opportunities. And I think that one of the most important things in my journey has been connections and like maintaining relationships, no matter how big or small, no matter how seemingly insignificant they might be. And even if you don't get along with people, there's never a reason to burn a bridge because you never know where you might end up or where they might end up. And that could be a, a nice way of getting your foot in the door for an opportunity in the future. After working for Honey Grove for about six years, um, I left. I was sort of burnt out from the East Coast. I lived, um, grew up in Delaware, moved to Philadelphia, had lived on the East Coast my entire life, decided to move to Los Angeles. Uh, quite a big change, um, but the, the silver lining of that was I moved to Los Angeles without a job, just kind of was gonna go back to freelancing again because I'd done it successfully before and I knew enough people in the Los Angeles and the sort of West Coast region that I figured I could make it work. Plus with the digital age that we're in now, I think that it's easier than ever to work for anyone from anywhere, as long as you have good internet service. And as it turns out, um, a friend of mine who I'd worked with all the way back at the beginning of the 2000s in the advertising agency world, he was an illustrator, he was a tattoo artist, he had gone and started a cannabis company. Stayed in touch with him off and on over the years. He posted a job that was an entry level sort of graphic designer and I was like, well, clearly you know me and you know that I'm not an entry level, but do you need help? And he said, sure, but I don't think I can afford you. And I said, well, try me, let's like figure this out. Um, so long story short, I joined that company doing freelance sort of part-time work. That company got acquired by Green Thumb Industries and I came along with the team that got acquired. And once they learned my background in various consumer packaged goods and other highly regulated industries, it was a really good fit for the burgeoning cannabis industry that we're in now. And they're based in Chicago, but I get to stay based in Los Angeles, which I love even more in the wintertime. Um, and it's been great. And I still um, can do a little bit of freelance on the side here and there because as a creative person, I think that it's always nice to have another outlet besides the day job to keep your sort of creative senses tingling. Wow, that's great. And several times you commented on the importance of networking, which we will come back to throughout the session. Yeah, that's crucial. Oh. Okay, so I'm going to sort of split up the L.A. contingent. So, Professor Washington, take us through your journey. Well, it, um, going from point A to point B is never a straight line. I think uh, folks need to realize that. And if you go to the left or go to the right, um, that doesn't mean that you're not going towards your goals. So, you know, just stay focused on what, what you want to do. If you have realistic goals you can achieve them if you have hard work. My career uh, in journalism, is primarily in journalism, started off as a freelancer. Uh, when I was at Temple University, um, you know, had big dreams, wanted to do this, that, and the other, but needed to generate a little money. Uh, so I started uh, freelancing for the Philadelphia Tribune. Uh, one of the things that you need in any profession, um, either, you know, a standard job or if you're in an entrepreneurial area, you need to have some flexibility. Um, I wanted to initially do entertainment. That's where I saw my um, career path. I wanted to, I actually wanted to be a jazz DJ and I'm glad I disabused myself of that because there's very little jazz and no jazz DJs anymore. But um, starting off as a writer, uh, the, they had staff writers that were doing the big events, the, um, the well-known, artists, the ones that you would see on the Grammys or whatever. So I created a niche for myself. I decided that I would do community-based uh, entertainment. Um, no, it wasn't glamorous, uh, but it did tell stories and it did give me a little income. Uh, so I would spend Saturday nights and Friday nights at the church basements and, um, and uh, recreation centers and <laughs> being insulted, uh, but you know, you do what you have to do. And when I say insulted, I remember this one night, I go out, I have my, my wife with me. She's like five or six months pregnant. It is snowing like crazy. We didn't know how we were going to get home. 
And the woman said, well, the place is sold out. I said, well, you know, my wife is pregnant because she have a seat. No, she has to stand up because nobody, you know, we're going to have the place filled up. And I'm saying, I don't think so with all of this, with all of this snow. But anyway, uh, that position, that freelance position led to a full-time position. And I just started getting full-time positions, first at the Philadelphia Tribune, uh, then a a tabloid paper that doesn't exist anymore in Philadelphia called the Philadelphia Journal. Worked with the Philadelphia Daily News for 10 years. And during these times, I freelanced on the side as a writer. Uh, when things would come up in Philadelphia, like the May 1985 move bombing, um, you know, I was there, I did some reporting on it. So I was able to market uh, stories to other entities around the country. Um, my only time away from journalism was a couple of years that I spent working with the Supreme Court of uh, Pennsylvania in the Office of the Chief Justice. Um, and at that point, my freelancing had to go covert uh, because as a member of the staff of a, of a justice in the Supreme Court, you can't take positions on things. You're supposed to keep your mouth shut. So I started, I kept writing under different pseudonyms. Uh, some of the pseudonyms were male. Some of the pseudonyms were female. Um, I remember one of them was uh, Cindy Smith. I don't know how I put those two things together. But, um, then I, when I left the Chief Justice's office, I started getting into uh, management positions in the news business. So it was my responsibility to hire and cultivate freelancers, uh, people who came in with ideas. Um, and they were good ideas. I could work and build on them. I you know, would give them opportunities. And I would give them opportunities in part, one, because I needed content all the time to fill the paper. But from the vantage of that's how I started, I wanted to be able to make opportunities for other people. A couple of years, uh, in the, about six years as a newspaper manager, I got an opportunity to come to Temple University, which was um, fantastic. So I've been here for 23 years. And in the time that I've been working as a professor here in the journalism department, I continued to freelance. I had opportunities to do columns, uh, write commentary. I wrote commentary for the Tribune for, again, you know, second time around, about 17 years. I even uh, had a freelance opportunity with uh, Aldea, which is the uh, Spanish language newspaper in Philadelphia. They translated my, my copy into Spanish, but it was bilingual. The front part of the um, paper was uh, in Spanish and then the back part was uh, in, in English. And uh, throughout my time at, uh, in the journalism department, I've continued to uh, freelance um, here and there. Uh, I would just, uh, my recommendation would just say, you know, be persevere. Um, you're gonna have ups, you're gonna have downs. Uh, get as many skills as you can. And particularly in the journalism world now, you need to not only be able to write report and interact with people, but you need to have multimedia skills. And But with those multimedia skills, you're not limited to journalism. You can do all kinds of, uh, provide all kinds of services to people who need those video or um, posting things on the web. Uh, so again, I would just urge folks to uh, be flexible, uh, be committed, dwell on your um, self-confidence and be willing to work hard. And if you get knocked down, push off those bruises, get up and keep going. Okay, great. Thank you. Erica, talk to us about going from BFA to a Hollywood talent agent. Well, I'm not a talent agent. I'm a career coach. But sorry, close. sorry. No, no, very, <laughs> it's okay. I know people that don't work in the industry don't understand the difference. That's okay. <laughs> but thank you so much, Alan, for having me. And oh my gosh, I'm so inspired already just by hearing the first two people speak. Um, so I grew up acting and singing and then started designing the flyers and the programs for the shows that I was in and realized, oh my gosh, I love graphic design. So I went to Tyler and I got a degree in graphic design, but I still had this love for the industry because of my whole background acting and singing growing up. And I was really enamored with Hollywood. I had spent a summer in LA at UCLA doing a theater program during high school. Uh, 
And I, I just kind of, I don't know, I, I, I bought into all the glamour that Hollywood sells and <laughs> I just thought LA was the coolest place. So I decided to move to LA and work in television. And I worked as a graphic designer, designing graphics for the sets and the props. So basically if, a, if you're watching a TV show and it takes place in a restaurant, I designed the signage for the restaurant out front. I designed the menus. Anything in a scene that a graphic designer would have done in a real life is what I would do for a TV show. Uh, so I did that. I've done that now for 13 years. And I mean, the entire time I was basically a freelancer because when you are on a TV show, you're W2, you're on their payroll, but you go from show to show and in between you know, sometimes I was off for like several months in between shows. If I, you know, especially in the beginning of my career where I just didn't know a lot of people yet. And so I would have to, you know, do freelance graphic projects to take me through so that I could afford to stay in LA while I waited for my next opportunity for the next show. So I, I've been freelancing for basically the whole 13 years. Um, and then five or six years ago, told Alan this story, so sorry, you're going to hear it again. Um, <laughs> I was working on a TV show at Warner Brothers. It's called The Fosters. I don't know if anyone has seen that show. And I was, um, I was sitting at a table in this bungalow, and we had some downtime in between graphic projects. So I was watching YouTube during my downtime, and I happened to come across this video of Oprah interviewing Jack Canfield. Now, if you don't know who Jack Canfield is, and you want to freelance or be an entrepreneur, go look him up because he has an incredible book that really helped me break into Hollywood 13 years ago when I knew nobody. I had no connections um, and I broke in rather quickly. I booked my first TV show two weeks after moving to LA. Uh, but Jack Canfield is the co-creator of Chicken Soup for the Soul. And he also has this amazing book called The Success Principles. And so I saw this video of Oprah interviewing him and I was so excited because I'm a fan of Jack and I read that book all those years ago. And I don't even remember what they were talking about. I don't remember what Oprah asked him. I don't remember what the topic of conversation was, but all I remember is that I started to well up with tears. And I just had this moment, like this voice in my head saying, Erica, you're supposed to be helping people too. Like, you know, watching Oprah, I mean, not that I'm like he here to be the next Oprah or anything, but just seeing Oprah and Jack, two people that basically make this living helping others, I felt that that was what I needed to be doing. So that's what led me to start a coaching business and started that. Now it's been five or six years where I help other Hollywood creatives because I built this amazing career and I was living my dreams. And, you know, I've worked on over 30 television shows at this point and I saw other people struggling with their Hollywood dreams and I wanted to help them. So that's what led me to start this business. Um, and it's, it's been pretty, pretty incredible. I've been working with actors, writers, directors, people in front of the camera, people behind the camera. Um, my clients have booked work on Netflix and HBO and Hulu and every other network under the sun. Um, and it's, it's been really awesome. I mean, it's been really hard, <laughs> you know, freelancing, being an entrepreneur has, um, like Lynn was saying, there's a, a lot of ups and downs, a lot of obstacles, uh, but, but it's also been really incredible. Great. Okay. Thank you. So Michael, you are the one here who is in, other than yoga, a licensed field. Can you talk a little bit? I'm going to switch a little tones a little bit. If you're a healthcare practitioner or anything where you need to be licensed or officially credentialed, how do you start? How do you even figure out what you need to do to be able to become a freelancer or a sole practitioner or a sole proprietor? Yeah, um, and thank you for having me on here. First of all, before I answer that question and hearing everyone's background, this makes me feel like I'm an oddball here, but it so it sounds so great. Um, so <laughs> I think it um, it finds it finds you um, when you're not looking where when you're not necessarily seeking for it all the time. Um, 
how I got into it is you like like um, Erica was saying about a book, Change Your Life. There's this book by a famous ancient composer, meaning 15th century music composer. And his idea was that it's not the, when you create beautiful things, whether it's art or jobs or, or doing something, was that it's the constant drip on the stone that breaks it down, not the gush of water. Um, meaning it's the perseverance that comes into play. So when, when I was in my job, I'm working as a clinician and working with difficult clients. And I've worked with traumatized youth for a long time. I hated working for an agency because the system was broken. And so what I meant by finding me was that it was, I felt like I was losing my soul by being in a service for an agency that wasn't always really helping out its staff. So I just went out and I wasn't a very good networker at the time. So I started doing extra trainings and different things and getting licenses and proficiencies and certification and other forms of therapy. And then it just kind of finds you of when you're searching for that meaning and you're doing what you uh, want to do and, and um, also searching for some purpose, um, which is a really important aspect. It, it really, it makes it much easier because it finds you and you people come because you're searching and you're working with them. And then that, that just creates a snowball effect. In fact, you almost have to say, you know, enough, I can't do anymore because it just, it's by itself. It, it works by just putting it out there and then helping one, one person and another person tells that, and then it just keeps snowballing. Um, that's probably the best answer I can give. Okay, great. Okay, so I'm gonna open this up to anyone on the panel or all of you. Emotionally and financially, what do I need to do to prepare to launch my freelancing or gig or whatever business I wanna launch on my own? Hmm. Go on, Erica. Oh, okay. Emotionally and financially. I yes. think it's, it's a good question because you definitely need to prepare both of those things. Um, I think speaking first financially, it, it really depends on what you're going into freelance business with. I mean, because I think that there's there's going to be a huge range depending on what you're doing. Um, I think like I always I always tell my clients that you want to view your business as a business. People, you know, I think in the beginning, people are very hesitant to invest money in themselves or in their business. They just want to, you know, not spend a penny and start and get things started. But it's rare that you don't need a single penny to get things started. I mean, I think that you can certainly grow. You know, you're like, I've invested in, in more expenses as my business grew and I started to make some money. But it's good to go in with the mindset of like, this is an investment and I'm investing into my business and that is going to help me create a profit. Um, but again, like it could be something like super simple. You might only need to set up PayPal and be able to, you know, start taking money depending on, you know, what you do. You might have supplies, you might have, um, you know, I, I don't know if it's a brick and mortar type thing. I, you know, there's, there's going to be different expenses for each person. But I think at least go into it with, I'm going to invest in my business and I understand that it's going to take some startup costs. Um, and then, you know, financially, I mean, emotionally, I, you know, I loved what everybody else has said so far, even hearing everybody's, um, hearing everybody's journey on the panel that has spoken so far, I'm thinking like, wow, they must have learned so much. They had so many different things that they did and uh, so many different skills that they needed. I think that you need to emotionally prepare as in, I have to believe in myself. I have to believe that this can happen and that I can do this. Um, and, and I'm going to, and I'm going to continue to believe that because especially in the beginning, it takes time. It takes time to get a business off the ground. It takes time to get clients. It takes, get sometimes get takes time to get paid and have the money start coming in and creating a profit. So you really need to do the, you know, we call it the, like do the mindset work of believing in yourself. And because the perseverance, if you aren't prepared to persevere, it's, you're not going to, you're not going to get to the 90 days. You're not going to get to the 
180 days, you know, you're not going to get to the 365 days. So I would say to emotionally prepare, I, I highly recommend the success principles that really, really helped me when I was first starting out. I think that that is what helped me, um, you know, break in so quickly. You know, they talk about rejection a lot. I have an entire chapter in my book about rejection, <laughs> most shameless plug, um, because I think that it, it, you know, it really helped for me to learn when I was just starting out that Jack Canfield, that Chicken Soup for the Soul was rejected 144 times by publishers before it got published. Because me going into starting my own thing and trying to get work on my own and just starting out, knowing that he was rejected 144 times made my 20th time, you know, a lot less, a lot less scary or a lot less damaging emotion, like in my mind. Because what happens is we tell ourselves stories about what it means, like, oh, this is never going to happen. Oh, it's never going to work out. I'm never going to get those clients, this is, you know, all of that kind of stuff. So I'm kind of rambling a little bit, and that was maybe not very well organized, my thoughts, but <laughs> emotionally, you just got, you got to, you got to do the mindset work. You got to believe in yourself. You got to prepare and decide, like, I'm, I'm in this. I'm in this for the long game. I know that I can do this no matter what comes my way, and I'm ready. Okay, great. <laughs> Anyone on the panel want to build on that or take their answer a different direction? Well, I, I would just like to endorse what, what Eric was talking about, the mindset, that mental preparation, that belief in yourself, uh, that um, power of positive thinking is so essential to get your idea to the execution phase. Uh, you have to also be realistic uh, in starting any kind of business or any kind of freelancing endeavor. Um, the first few months, the first few years, you're going to be lean. Um, and if you're looking to make a whole lot of money, many times you, it might be better to just buy a bunch of lottery tickets, irrespective of the large, um, uh, 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 should I say, the, the little likelihood of, of winning uh, the, anything. But uh, I, 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 the only thing I would just continue to hit on is that ability to prepare yourself mentally to do what you want to do. And I think part of that preparation is a willingness to make the sacrifices that are necessary. If you're working for yourself, you're going to be working a whole lot harder and a whole lot longer than if you were, say, working for somebody else. Uh, freelancing and, and entrepreneurial uh, endeavors are not nine to five. You're going to be working seven days a week. Uh, and then you'll find that eighth day that is folded into the seventh. Uh, so you, you just have to make that commitment to work hard and um, stick to it uh, to get what you want. Uh, I'm, I'm impressed uh, with what she was uh, mentioning about the author of, of Chicken Soup being rejected 140 times. You know, a lot of people get discouraged after the first or second time. They take it personally. It's a part of the business. Because you're rejected, I, I read a letter that a friend of mine had uh, received from a, a book agent and he was saying, listen, I, I like what you've written, um, but I just don't think it fits together here and there. But I acknowledge it just might be the, where my mind was at when I read it. If I read it next week or yesterday, it would be a different thing. But right now I don't want it. You know, so he's calling me saying, hey, what does this mean? I said, first of all, the guy wrote you back. You know, <laughs> he gets 10,000 inquiries every day he wrote you back and he gave you some ideas in terms of where to go so you take um positive things where you see them even if they're even if they're not positive things but keep that energy moving forward to fulfill your goal right okay so jen and michael i'm going to take the feedback from erica and lynn and ask you a specific question they talk about the importance of positive thinking and self-confidence and not taking rejection personally. As I've worked with students and alumni looking to get into their own businesses or do freelancing, there's often a ton of trepidation and a ton of fear of rejection. So how do students go from their current state or alumni of lack of confidence and trepidation about rejection to having the positive outlook and the resilience that Lynn and Erica are suggesting? 
How's that for an easy question? No, you know, it's funny. So, sorry, Jen, were you going to go there? Okay. Um, I'll build on yours. Yeah, well, <laughs> you might need to, unless it might suck. Um, so I was going to build, uh, I said, that's exactly right, is that fear, is I, I tell tell students and, and people that to to embrace the fear and not avoid it because um, Jack Canfield, as Erica brought up, actually did say everything you want is on the other side of fear, that it's a necessary part of the process. And and there's no way you can read a thousand books, but you there's no way anyone would tell you, think positively. You have to embrace those moments and wallow in all those emotions because if you don't, you're going to avoid it and never get around that. And if you personalize it, then that's where you're going to get stuck. In fact, I keep a document of all the rejections from the grants, from my from from articles and journals and books of the things that people have said to me. So it keeps me motivated and not to personalize it because I know it it happens a lot of rejection. So that fear, I would say, if that's answering your question, is stay with it, embrace it, enjoy that, and be in the moment. Like a pig wallows in mud, embrace that fear because if not, you know, the only way out is through, as Robert Frost said. <clears throat> I couldn't agree more. I think that, you know, acknowledgement is important. I also think that like, it's almost as if you would give yourself um, a window of time to, to not, to not um, wallow in it too much. So that that pig in the dirt, <laughs> a little bit of wallowing in it so that you understand and you can learn from it, but not to let it derail your, your dreams, your vision. Um, and I think having a, a support network is super important. You know, friends, colleagues, former coworkers, people who can give you real honest feedback, I think is super important as a way of like learning from any feedback, learning from any rejections um, and being able to find some, you know, nugget of positivity that you can take forward because, you know, somebody saying think positive all the time isn't always as attainable as it sounds like it might be, um, especially when you're in it. And I think like, you know, I think acknowledging it is super important, but trying to find like, you know, this person rejected me, but now I have this connection. Now I have there's something there that you can build upon um, and finding ways to like use it to propel you forward. Um, and then that support network, I think is super helpful because it can feel lonely. It can feel isolating sometimes, especially if you're used to working in a more dynamic social um, working environment. I think having a network, finding other people who are also freelancers or also independent um, in your field or a complementary field can be a great way to um, have a support net um, around you so that you can, you know, bounce things off of them, get really critical thinking that you would normally get in the workplace that you don't have anymore. Okay, great. Okay, so I think the panel just answered some of this, but I'm a student or a recent alum and I'm setting up my own business. What are the three most important things I should do right away to get started? And I'll open that up to anyone who would like to respond. I can take a stab at it. I'm sure there'll be three different answers possibly from all of us. Um, it was something I was going to say earlier. Um, I would recommend an accountant because an accountant will help you assess what your money situation is, what you need to bring in, what you need to put out, what things you can write off. I think there's a lot of hidden um, expenses that you need to spend on yourself and your business, but those can be write-offs. Um, and then you'll be able to, I think, a good accountant um, who's just the just savvy enough in terms of independent um, freelance workers um, will give you the tips and tricks that you need to be able to feel better about those expenses that you might not want to spend, that you might not think are necessary. Um, competition. I would look at your competitors. I would look at like, where are you in the landscape um, and how do you offer something different, better, more unique than what you're going up against, as opposed to thinking that you're the only person who's going to offer this particular service. Um, and then that support network in terms of like, who are you going to, who are your new coworkers? And because you're by yourself sort of now, and what is your what is your like work environment going to be like and understanding like whether that's like a corner of your house that you carve out or you turn your desk or you turn your chair around so it doesn't face your bed anymore, just something that helps differentiate it so that you have um, a place that you can focus completely on what your new, your new job is. Great. Anyone else on this? 
I'll add some. Um, this is fun. <laughs> By the way, I, I love Jen's answers. Um, so one of the things that was new for me that I had to learn when I was starting out was to really think about the customer and not myself so much. So, you know, I mean, it's like, it is important for me to do things that I enjoy and that fill me up and that feel good to me. But when you're starting out, at least in the business that I, you know, was in, in coaching and, and really even for graphic design, I think, I think even for artists, you want to think about like, who is your ideal person that's going to do business with you, that's going to buy from you and what problem are you solving for them? Because I think that, you know, especially when I was starting out, it was very in my head and, and very me, 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 you know, focused on myself and, and what kind of work I want to do. But also you have to think about what are you, what problem are you solving for your customer? You know, for example, not even related to Hollywood Success Coach, but as a graphic designer, I notice that sometimes people come to me after they've gone to another graphic designer because they felt like the other person didn't understand their vision fully. And for whatever reason, I could have one conversation and understand it very well and deliver them exactly what they were looking for. So it's like, oh, I happen to have this skill where maybe I'm a good communicator or maybe I'm a good listener and I can just understand what they're looking for. And so this problem that I'm solving is that I'm offering, you know, this service that I really understand what the client wants and I'm here for you and I'm here to help execute your vision. So, and I think even if you were a musician or something, like who is going to be listening to your music? Like really get clear on who that person is when they're in their car listening to your music or if they're at your concert, like what, what is that person? Um, because without clients or customers, you don't have any revenue, <laughs> you know, you don't have any money coming in. So um, for me that, you know, that's something that I would add that I think is incredibly important to, you know, to help get clear on what you will be selling or offering and how it's going to solve a problem for the people that you are selling to. So Erica, I'm going to invite you next semester to guest lecture in my Lean Startup course, because one of the things we try to teach within the Innovation and Entrepreneurship Institute is to be market focused, customer focused, and not me focused. Yes. I mean, even when I was starting coaching, I did so many phone calls with artists to feel like, like, what are you struggling with? How can, like, what do you need help with? You know, and it's, it, it's time consuming, you know, but it, it is so important to get and because then, you know, even the surveys and things like that, you take what your customer is looking for and put it into your marketing and you take their exact language and the way they are speaking it and putting that into your marketing. And then they go, Oh my God, you read my mind. How did you know? So it, it yeah, super important. <laughs> okay. So Lynn, I, I want to go off of these points because when I work with a lot of artists or journalists or photographers, what I hear is, well, I have a certain way of designing that's in my heart or writing that is my style. So how do you merge that with the fact that you have to meet the needs of customers to have a sustainable business? Not trying to sound too trite. Don't take yourself so seriously. If your intent is to sell a product, you are selling that product to someone, be it a photograph, a, a song that you wrote, or from my field, an article. If the person who you want to sell it to, if they have certain, um, certain ideas that they want, you have to comport with what, what they want. And that doesn't mean that you're taking a back seat, that you're slashing yourself out. It's just that you're being commercial. Um, I try to tell folks, you know, just like something as simple as writing, um, a lot of people want to, they, they think that they have to be touched by the creative muse. No, writing is a business. You have to write whether your stomach's upset, whether you're having a bad air day, whatever, you have to put it out. So uh, be, be adaptive and, you know, provide what your, your client wants. And understand that, like in writing, one of the aspects is, um, you know, you're going to go through an editing process. And at once you're in that editing process, 
you are um, at the whim of the editor. So they're going to change your whole story around uh, many times. Now, what is, the, what is your goal? To see your work published and get a full fee as opposed to a kill fee? Um, or this is the way I think it should be. And if you don't do it, then I'm going to take my copy and my ball and go home. Um, you, if you take the latter too often, you will be in your room uh, getting no work. <laughs> okay, great. Okay, so Michael, a question for you as you were in private practice, and I'm sure the same is true for other freelancers, solopreneurs. What type of infrastructure do you suggest be set up? And that could be range from an Excel spreadsheet to keep track of your revenues and expenses to some type of scheduling or project management so you can look for new clients while completing your work for current clients. What do you recommend someone start with in terms of that infrastructure base? Yeah, that's a great question. And I was gonna, that's what I was gonna say about the three things you need, especially in clinical work. Um, and what everyone else is saying, it really goes along with what, you know, what I do. Um, it, but it's funny, there can be so different, but you need a strong database. There's a lot of apps for managing, for documentation. In my, in the clinical field, it's documentation, documentation, documentation with billing and notes and assessments and treatments. There's so much things. So you have to have a strong foundation because if you don't, you'll spend all your time worrying about following up on all the administrative aspects of doing your job, and then you'll lose the creative aspects of it. So if you have a strong foundation in some of the databases or apps out there that really help you, um, that's what I would recommend. And there, some of the programs are free. Um, I wouldn't recommend all the programs, but I mean, simply start on a Google form or a spreadsheet where you can share, you can do forms and they can do data responses and stuff if you're doing behavioral stuff. Um, but having a good plan, it's, it can be flexible, obviously, is a really the strong first infrastructure you need to do clinical work. Um, the second is liability insurance, because if you don't have that, it's gonna be a mess. And I would say the third would be a lawyer. And if you even better, a lawyer accountant, which I had, meaning they can help with any situation because you're gonna get sued because it's in a process of, of healthcare. It's, it's a big aspect of, um, yeah, that's the infrastructure. Unfortunately, it's not the glamorous part of it, but that's what you need. You need that's, what, that's what, yeah. Okay. So, Jen, when you were freelancing creatively, did you have liability insurance? Yes. Okay. And, and I had to have it for yoga teaching also. Ah, yes. Yeah, because people like me could hurt themselves trying to do that. <laughs> but can you explain to our audience why, as a creative freelancer, you needed liability insurance? Um, I, well, I, I had an accountant who also had a lawyer. I don't know if he had a lawyer on staff, but I was able to kind of get a one-stop shop with my accountant to get all of those things that I didn't know I needed set up, which was super helpful um, because somebody can sue you for anything these days because you agree, you think you have, and it depends on also if you're doing contracts for every project. Um, some people do, some people don't. There are pros and cons, I suppose. But, you know, if there's a misunderstanding about what the work was supposed to be versus what it is, um, if you don't deliver something in a timely fashion, if they're not happy with the work, if some of these things aren't ironed out ahead of time, there's a good chance that they could, you know, take you to court for it. And all this great work you put into your new business goes out the window and gets sucked up into lawyer and court fees. And it, it's a protection, it's protection for yourself. And, you know, it's a kind of, it's a business expense that you, you will be able to write off. So it's, there's no need, there's no reason to not have it. Okay. Okay. And Lynn, did you do it as a freelance writer? You're on mute, Lynn. Yeah. Okay. I I'm muting myself. No, I um, unlike uh, the my uh, fellow panelists, I, I never set up a business as such. Um, so in terms of lawyers and accountants, although I have had, had to deal with them, um, I just kind of like plowed ahead. I did make sure that I had a um, a rider on my homeowner's insurance that would give me uh, some protection uh, for being sued for libel because I've been sued for libel individually once and that's no fun and also uh, as a part of working with some newspapers 
have been a part of uh, liable suits. Uh, so yeah, you, you definitely need a, a lawyer or access uh, to legal counsel and legal advice. And that um, accountant is absolutely important in terms of helping you organize your finances and also stay organized to a point where you can um, be able to file uh, taxes properly. And if you get audited, which I've had a couple of times, uh, somebody there to um, guide you through the process. Okay, great. And I do want to reemphasize a point that you just made, Lynn. You know, for those of you who are here, when Sharon Irwin spoke about legal forms and either sole proprietorship, uh, LLC, limited liability corporation, or partnership, no matter which of those, I would very strongly recommend, as has our panel, that you have liability insurance. So even if, like Lynn, you didn't form a business, you're operating just as a sole proprietor, which I have done, be sure you add liability insurance, umbrella liability insurance, to whatever personal insurance you have. And it's relatively cheap. But be sure you have that, because otherwise you just can lose a lot of your life very quickly. Okay, so I want to do a couple rapid fire questions, um, and then we'll take Q&A from the audience. So real quickly, and anyone could start and we'll just go across the panel. What's the biggest key to being successful on your own? Lynn, why don't you start? <laughs> um, I would just say, uh, as I've been saying, you know, drive and, and hard work um, and, and commitment to succeed. Um, and I, I, I kind of see life as uh, an ocean, you know, and with the waves, you have peaks and troughs. So you um, bask when you're at the peak and you know when you're down in those troughs that eventually it's going to come back up. Okay, great. Erica? Same question? Same question. Yeah, I would I would basically repeat that. I think the most important thing is the the belief in yourself and the belief in what's possible. 100%. Okay, great. Michael. Yeah, I agree. I would say two things really don't have a fallback plan because if you have one, you'll fall back on it. Um it would be committed and dedicated to what you want to do and it, and it'll work. And uh, this is a weird one to say, but don't uh, say yes to a lot. I know people say you should take care of yourself, but I found much more opportunities and um, less failure when I didn't say no to something I didn't want to do. For okay. example, this panel tonight, I didn't sit no, I'm kidding. Um, okay, great. Jen? Um, I echo the same sentiments that everyone else has mentioned for sure. And then I think networking is my biggest one because I feel like every great job, uh, project lead, apartment, house, like boyfriend, like people, like just those <laughs> great things that you have recommendations, you have connections, you have um, some kind of inherent tie, even if it's a tiny shred of one, you can turn that into a massive opportunity. Okay, so my next question is, what's the most important way to get new clients? Jen has weighed in on networking. Michael. Um, do do good with the client you're working with, and that's the best way to get new clients. <laughs> okay, so word of mouth referral. Yeah, by, yeah, yeah. That, good. Okay, Erica. Social media. I think the fastest way the, to get new clients is through social media. Okay, how do you choose which so social media platform you should use? I mean, essentially, they say to go where your people are hanging out, you know, so obviously, if you're trying to reach, you know, the younger generation, go on TikTok. Um, or like for me, there's a lot of artists, singers, dancers, people like that on TikTok. So I do have a lot of audience people on TikTok. But LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, like where, you know, like I was thinking about Lynn, like so much of political journalism is on Twitter, you know, so go there. Writers are often on Twitter um, because it's a writing platform, essentially, even though it's a short amount of characters. So think about where your people, your clients, your customers are hanging out and, and post on social media there. Okay, great. Lynn, number one way to get new clients. Um, <laughs> 
since I'm not in the business, uh, I don't get new clients. I get new students every semester, and that's because they're registering for my class. <laughs> so I'm not soliciting them. Soliciting them. Uh, so I'm not really a, a, the best person to um, provide some cogent advice in that uh, in that area. Okay. All right. What was your biggest challenge and how did you overcome it? Michael. Um, starting telehealth, that was the biggest challenge. Um, and, and yeah, how did I overcome it? I had to, uh, there's no other choice. We have to do all this now and you just find a way and you have to deal with the sound and all that stuff. So we figured out ways it takes little bumps and bruises, but yeah, um, telehealth was the biggest challenge. Did you get trained in it or did you basically learn by doing? Crash course, really, in some way, especially with the liability, with uh, being a licensed professional counselor, you, you you have to take some a little bit of that ethic training and just to learn about more of that, to so do some reading and other adjustments. But other than that, no, because you just had to try and do it. I, I didn't have a time or or the ability at the time, you know, when it, it quickly changed to figure out the best way to do it. I had to try it and then go from there. <clears throat> okay, yeah. good. Lynn, biggest challenge and how you overcame it? The biggest challenges that I've had have been internal. Um, getting over a, a lack of self-confidence and getting over a fear of failure. And how I did that just by pushing through. Uh, unfortunately, it took me half my life to pass through or push through it. Uh, but uh, the desire to get it done and, and the recognition that those were uh, impediments, uh, but they were impediments that I was putting on myself. Okay, great. Ah, okay. Uh, Erica, same question. Um, I would agree with Lynn. I also have really struggled with internal um, obstacles, but I will also say that my biggest tangible obstacle was breaking into Hollywood. And I overcame it by cold emailing 150 people until one person said, sure, I'll help you. Let me take a look at your work. So um, yeah, breaking in when I knew nobody in the industry. Okay. So persistence. Persistence. Yes. And putting yourself out there. You know, I had to cold emailing 150 people. I mean, that's, you know, it, that takes risk putting yourself out there, uh, that kind of thing. Okay, good. Jen? Biggest challenge and how you overcame it? Um, I think there's the word free in the word freelance, yet it doesn't always feel like you have the freedom. And I think one of the things I struggled with a lot when I was completely freelance was like, how do I embrace this non-traditional work lifestyle and do things that I wouldn't be able to do if I had a day job, but still be persistent and still, you know, really grind through all the work that needs to be done, but still embrace this idea that I liked so much, yet not get trapped by the fear of failure or the fear of, you know, consistency with work. And I still struggle with that. So it's like an ongoing battle, like, you know, that's sort of a misnomer that freelance, you're not really free, you're actually more chained to your own personal journey um, in a different way. And I think, you know, making sure that that's like what you want to pursue as you go down that path, I think is a real, is a real point to focus on at some point in this journey when you start to embark on it. Okay. Well, that's a great lead into my final question for you before we open it up to the audience. So there are a lot of people here who are considering whether to embark on a freelancing career or trying to sell their own artwork or being a solopreneur. How does someone know whether this is the right option for them? I mean, if they're sitting there right now trying to decide, do I do this? Do I try to get a corporate or a full-time job with a nonprofit? Or do I try to do both? How do they figure that out? Whoever wants to go first is welcome. Well, I think one of the great things about being a young person is that you're a young person. So I would recommend that you pursue your dreams. If they if it works out, fine. If not, then you reposition yourself and keep moving forward. If you get to, um, let's say, an advanced age in life, I don't want to say old people because I'm at that age now, 
and you don't know where you're going and what your life is about, you got a real problem. But, you know, use youth. They always say that um, uh, youth is wasted on the young. Don't fall into that. Take advantage of that energy. Take advantage of that opportunity. Uh, and you have time to try different things and find a thing that works for you. Very often what you think is your ideal, you will find that it's not and you will get into something that you may have hated. For me, at one point in my life, the thought of being a newspaper reporter literally made me sick on my stomach. And as it turns out, that's the one thing that I really, really, really liked. And even though I'm doing other things, I'm still working as a reporter. I like it. Okay, great. Anyone else wanna share? I would um, add that, oh my gosh, I just got pandemic brain. What was the question? <laughs> That's a new term. How do you know? How do you know? Okay. So so I, lo I love what Lynn said too, that, you know, being young, because I think for me, it's a feeling. Like for me, it was like this desire to be on my own. But I also have friends who know for sure that they don't want to be an entrepreneur and they prefer to, you know, be working for somebody else. And some of it I learned working for somebody else, you know, some of it came from, from experience for, you know, for example, when you are a freelancer or you are an entrepreneur, nobody is giving you a paycheck every week or every month. You are responsible for that. And some people that's, that's too scary. That feels too unstable and they don't want that. And they like knowing they're getting their paycheck every in TV. It's every Thursday or whatever, once a month. And so it, I think there's like a, you know, what your desires are and personality wise a little bit with that as well. Um, but for me, I like really knew when I was working on a TV show and I couldn't stand when my boss would sort of dictate how I needed to spend my time because I am somebody who is very good at managing my time. I mean, I wrote a book in a pandemic. I run my own business for five or six years successfully, you know, I know how to be efficient. I know how I work best. I know how to get stuff done. And when my bosses would have me like spend a ton of time on something that would never really be seen on a TV show, it was so inefficient. I, I really did not like that feeling of not controlling how I spent my time to make the best end product. So I, I, that was sort of where it started for me. So I, I think if you don't already have that inkling, you don't already have that feeling within you, you know, Gary Vaynerchuk always talks about, you know, being an entrepreneur, it's like, it's like in your blood, it's like who you are, you know, because it, it's a big decision to go off on your own and, and have all of the responsibility on you. So I would say if you're not already having the inkling and you're not sure, try both, you know, start, you know, dip your feet in both. And, and I think you'll, you'll learn from experience what feels good for you. Okay, good. Mike or Jen, anything to add? I think being, if you're not an organized person, I think you will need assistance because when you're on your own and it's just you, I think if you're, I, I know people who are freelance who are not organized people and it's a struggle. And it's like, if they're not organized, you, cause you're the, you are, you are accounting, you are <laughs> HR, you are, um, you know, you are the single point of contact for your clients. And if you're not an organized person, like I would consider like partnering with someone who is so that they can handle that side of the business. If that's not where your strengths are, but maybe your strengths are more specific, but understand where your strengths and weaknesses are so that you can have, you know, a partner or a network of people who can help you with the things that you're not good at because you probably can't do everything yourself. Okay, great. Yeah, I was just going to go on and I what everyone's saying, but be authentic and genuine with yourself that, meaning if you need that structure, you know, that's, that's what you need. If you don't, you don't, um, it, it worked for you and, it, and, and, don't, you know, just try to be genuine with yourself and authentic of, say, this does work and I don't have to fit anyone else's mold. This is the way I want to do it. Yeah. Okay, great. Okay, so we're going to let the panel take a couple seconds to catch their breath. I would say thank you. I thought this conversation was outstanding and everyone's viewpoint was great. If you have questions for any of the panelists, please put them in the chat room. 
And in the meanwhile, if I can do this, um, I'm going to share my screen. What I'd ask everyone who's attending to take about three minutes, and I, for some reason, it's not working. Um, Alan, I chatted the link. Yeah, okay, great. I'm just trying to get the code on there. Oh, I can't sh screen share, so that's fine. Okay, so if you go to the link, and it's just a quick anonymous questionnaire where we ask for some feedback so we can continually improve the programs. Um, so if you could just take two or three minutes for that, the panelists can catch their breath, and then we'll go to Q&A. Okay, so while people are finishing that up, I would like to ask the first question. Realistically, if I'm a student or alum thinking of starting my freelance business, how long should I expect before I'm basically bringing in enough money to cover my costs? So anyone on the panel want to take a shot at that? I think it varies so much by industry. Um, I would plan for the worst in some ways just to manage your own expectations in like, I don't know, like a year minimum, probably, depending. And I think the other thing from a financial perspective that I knew was a thing, but I didn't realize how real it was until I started experiencing it is that you won't get paid right away. No one's going to pay you instantly. Usually but most services, like a lot of times there's this, you know, invoicing period, net 30, net 90, you know, you might have your own payment terms, but they might have their own payment terms. So a lot of times there's this like delay. And that I think was part of my my fears of like not being free because you don't know, well, I'm not going to get paid right away. And what's the next project? So kind of thinking ahead and planning ahead from a financial perspective would help a lot. Okay. Okay, good. Anyone else? Erica, how long did it take you once you went out to LA or Hollywood? Sorry. Oh gosh. Well, I booked my first TV show two weeks after moving to LA and I made pretty good money on that first show and then it was canceled and then I couldn't find another job for almost a year and I had to live off the money that I saved and it was incredibly challenging. Um, but it really took me a couple of years. I mean, in Hollywood, you know, I go from show to show. It, it took me a couple of years to feel like I had consistent money that I could, you know, live off of without being terrified. <laughs> Okay. Okay. So, My coaching business was a little faster, but yeah. Okay. So another question, and this goes right off what you were saying, Jen, how do you deal with clients who do not pay? I require a deposit up front. So at least if I've, um, you know, I've tried to acquire part of the money and then they've invested in me as much as I'm investing my time and energy in them. Yeah, and I, I'd say that's an excellent uh, point, Jen. And you have a reputation, so you could probably do that. But minimally, you mm -hmm. should sure. work it so you're paid a third, a third, a third. Mm -hmm. A third up front, a third maybe when you're halfway done, and, and a, a third, third on completion. completion. Yeah, it's. I think it's, 
you know, I always make the analogy with, with new clients, especially, you know, I've worked with clients who might not have worked with freelancers before, and they're not sure how it works. And I, it's like a dance or like a date, like you want to, you want to start off small and make sure that there's a good relationship from both sides before you go all the way. Okay. Anyone else? No. Okay. So one of the questions for each of you is, do you have your own company? And then there's a, associated with that is how long should I wait until I open a company? So anyone on the panel who'd like to answer those questions, please go ahead. I'll go. Um, I think it's probably going to be very different for each industry. Personally, I did not incorporate until my tax accountant did not want me to incorporate until I had an annual income of $100,000. So we waited until I hit six figures to become an S Corp. I'm sure it's very different for every other industry. You know, like if you're doing something like what Michael does, you know, I, I don't need all the licensing and all of the you know, the insurer, I, 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 my line of work doesn't require those things. So I could wait a little longer. Um, but that's just what my tax account had me do. Okay, good. Uh, my accountant, accountant advised me to uh, do S Corp. And it was more so to provide some shield for the uh, tax write offs. Um, he, he said that. Um, the government or the IRS specifically looks at S corps differently in terms of deductions versus a, a private individual. So I took okay. his advice. Uh, he didn't share it until we were getting ready to walk in <laughs> to the final audit before we went to court or the final meeting to try to resolve an IRS audit. And I'm like, why didn't you tell me this three years ago? <laughs> Fair question. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, and just out of interest, again, when we had the lawyer here, she actually was saying that most freelancers, et cetera, don't do S corps. They'll do an L limited liability corporation. But again, you see the variety here and how it really depends on your particular circumstance and situation. Okay. Another question. Is it necessary that you be an affiliate or accredited on a particular association before you start freelancing? Um, Eric, you, oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Go on, Michael. I, I think in, in particularly in my field, yes, because it's from an ethical standpoint, too, of how to market, how to do things. You might have to be responsible to that. I'm not – you can choose whatever you want, but it doesn't hurt. You get a lot of information. Um, there's conferences that can help you with networking and also learning new ideas and philosophies. So I would recommend being involved with an association at least. Um, licensing is boards. You don't have any accreditation with that, but it, it is what it is. But yeah, I would get involved in association. Yeah. Okay, good. Anyone else on that? The other thing I will say, and it's very competitive, but if you're thinking of freelancing, there are website freelancing marketplaces, such I guess the biggest now is Upwork. Um, you won't make a ton of money off of your clients there, but you will get clients and you'll build a portfolio of work that you could share with future clients that you get on your own. And, and, Erica or Jen, have you used any associations or marketplaces to build your business? I haven't directly, but I've used, you know, the, what you mentioned about Upwork in terms of like, if you need to build a portfolio, I think a portfolio of some kind, depending on what your nature of work is, something that shows what you're capable of. Um, and if you have any past clients that would act as references, I think those kinds of things are always helpful for new potential clients to feel reassured in your, your talent base. Okay. Okay. Lynn or Erica, anything to add there? My, I have a, 
so a lot of my clients, you know, they need day jobs as they're pursuing acting and writing and those, those things. And one of my, a couple of my clients, they all kind of taught each other. They, because they're actors, they can do voiceover. And so they used Upwork to get voiceover clients. And I mean, one of my clients was making four grand a month just from that. And so she was able to support herself financially, um, which was great. And then she was available for auditions and things like that because she was running on her own schedule. So yeah, I think, I think sites like Upwork, uh, you know, are, are really great, especially when you're starting out um, and, and you're working on, on building that portfolio and, and just adding the accreditation thing, by the way, like I don't have any of that. I feel like that's so specific to you know, each industry, but I don't have any licensing or credit or accreditation. Okay. Um, next question. As a freelancer, do you always need investors? And if so, how do you pick the right investor to ask for financial help? Do any of you have investors? Nope, I'm I'm my investor. I see you're shaking your head the same way, Lynn. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I will say that, you know, I, I don't work in a field that requires an investment of that sort. Like I don't need that sort of startup cash. But if you were, you know, there's so many, I feel like there are so many resources starting with books, um, you know, from people that that have done that. So if you if if you're in a field where you feel like you do need a large investment, you know, to begin with, I would do some research because apparently we have no insight for you here. So go research elsewhere. <laughs> well, and one other thing I'd say is I'm not aware of any freelancers that have outside investors. You know, just like in any startup, families and friends often early on. Yeah. Or there are some, if you're a freelancer in a certain area or you're trying to sell your artwork or do a documentary or perhaps a book, a lot of the crowdfunding sources are often utilized, even by like Hollywood directors and actors who want to do films. Mm -hmm. But if you're just going to be a freelance journalist or graphic artist or, you know, painter you're basically going to have to do it on your own and with friends and family okay we're almost out of time any other questions from the audience i think we covered all of them no oh yes all right how do you get seen as qualified in the field like life coach especially for getting the first couple clients? I guess that one's for me. <laughs> um, I think that in the beginning, you coach people for free. Unless you already have some sort of qualification, like you already have something to qualify you, you know, you can start at a fee that feels like it'll attract um, beginning clients. But you can also start by taking someone on, even if it's just for like two weeks or just doing one coaching call with somebody um, and, and coaching them for free in exchange for testimonials because testimonials, you know, is going to be super helpful for you to grow and to get more clients. So that's what I started to do in the beginning. And, and I had also built, I started building an audience through this other, uh, the, I had, I had a podcast um, that I had started about moving to LA and, and that also helped give me authority so people could listen to me for free and get, you know, get a feel of me for free. And that also helped, uh, attract some clients, but I do think it's helpful to coach people for free in the beginning. If you've never coached somebody before and, you know, to really build up those testimonials. Okay, good. And, you know, I've done some career consulting and I would often do a free session either for a group or an individual with the hope that it's basically converting into a paid customer. Lynn and Jen, you know, in the past, and I've worked with people from Tyler, 
uh, theater, film, media, art, who always said, don't do free consulting or don't do free work because it's such a too low a price ceiling. Over the past couple months, I've heard a different version, which is given how things are now, don't be afraid to do a free project if it gets you a lot of visibility. Can the two of you discuss that from both the creative design and the writing area, whether you recommend doing some free work or not? Well, I would just say, go, go ahead, Jen. No, oh, no, I was going to, I was asking you to go first. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I would say a mix. There is time where uh, there are occasions where it can be beneficial to you, not on initially, but definitely down the line to offer your services pro bono because you create relationships with people. Uh, they get to know you. Um, but the reality is you're in business to do business to make money. So you can't make pro bono all of your business you won't be able to uh, succeed. Uh, but no, I, I think showing that you would share your services to people, it, it, it shows a lot about you and it can pay dividends. That's, I guess that's the word I'm looking for. And those dividends will, will pay off later. Okay, great. What Joel, I usually okay. do, what I usually do is one, I want to make sure that the work that I'm doing is work that I want to do and I want to get more work of that kind. So that's a good reason to do it. And then I don't know if you've ever been to like a restaurant that has like a friends and family when you get the free food and drinks and they get to practice their service. And then sometimes they give you a bill to show you what it would have cost. Mm -hmm. um, I do an estimate. So I still do an estimate and I show them this is what I'm doing for you and this is how much I normally charge and here's why, you know, and for all these reasons why I'm going to, you know, give it to you for very small amount or free, but just so they understand the value of what they're receiving, not to like make them feel bad, but more so like that they understand that you you know how much your work is worth. 